<laughs> thanks, Annie. Th thanks for the invitation to, uh, to join with you today. So, um, when Annie asked me a few months ago <clears throat> to talk today, she gave me this title, Misconception and Misadventures in Science. Um, and at the time, I asked, could I add the subtitle Lessons from the 30th President? And I added that really just to give me latitude to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. And last night when I was putting this talk together, I still had no idea what I was going to say. She did ask to, for me to talk about some lessons and insights from my journey as a clinician scientist. Um, and so I'm going to just talk about what I, um, what I want to talk about and the, the, the things that I've picked up along the way over those last 32, 33 years. I am going to use the words of... Um, older and wiser people than me from disciplines outside of medicine, including the 30th president, although I don't think he actually was wiser than me, um, and others. And so um, if you forgive me, we will dip in and out of the words of various people um, across the, the next 20 minutes. I'm going to start with misadventures. Um, as you embark upon a career in medical science, medical research, you should have many misadventures. So this is in stark contrast to clinical care. And as the lead of patient safety, as Annie said, for our state, I am pleased that clinical care is progressively being re-engineered to um, prevent misadventures. So the way that clinical care is delivered today is very different to how clinical care was delivered when I started as a young graduate in 1986. Uh, and thankfully, the systems are getting better to constrain our practice to deliver best, most efficient, most cost-effective care, and to try and engineer out misadventure, mishap, medical error. The opposite should be true of medical research. Why do I say that? Well, it goes to the fundamental question of what actually is medical research? And I'm sure if we had taken a poll at lunchtime to describe what each and every one of us thought medical research was about, um, we would come up with you know, 40, 50, 60 different answers. For me, medical research is very simple. It is about peeling back the truth, understanding fundamental human biology, the cellular pathways that underpin health and disease. Because if we can understand the truth, then we can develop approaches for preventative health care, and we can develop approaches for therapeutic healthcare. And so the, the reason this is so different is that to pull back, to peel back the, and find the truth requires us to go into uncharted territory, to go into places that no person has gone before. And a bit like James T. Kirk, as you go into uncharted territories, if you are not meeting misadventure, then I just don't think you're working hard enough. If you're not failing in medical research, then you're not trying hard enough. This is Sir Harry Burns. He was a colorectal surgeon in Glasgow. And towards the end of his career, his surgical career, he recognized huge health inequities in the survival from um, colorectal cancer, solely dependent on where you lived in Glasgow. So the same patients, with the same disease, at the same stage of disease, we're having very different mortality outcomes depending on what their socioeconomic background was. He became Scotland's chief medical officer and in about 15 years transformed the landscape of health improvement in Scotland, such that Scotland, actually one of Europe's most impoverished nations, um, has one of the best health systems in the world. And a, a year or so ago, he was interviewed by Norman Swan on ABC's Health Report. You can access the interview. It's a fascinating journey in Sir Harry's um, career from a clinician to a public servant, a chief health officer. And Norman asked him, Harry, how have you achieved so much in such a short space of time? And Sir Harry said, one of my mottos in life is just to proceed until apprehended. <laughs> And as young clinician scientists, not clinicians, clinician scientists, we should just proceed until apprehended. 
So this is the Scottish borders. This is the River Tweed. It's one of the most beautiful parts of one of the most beautiful countries in the world. It's where, as a final year medical student in Edinburgh and as a young intern in Edinburgh, I wanted to be a GP with a small wee farm with frontage on this river, one of Scotland's premier salmon fishing rivers, where in the evening as the flies were hovering over the river and the salmon were jumping, I would be able to fly fish. In fact, here's a picture of me. Oh, no, that's another Ewan altogether. <laughs> um, the reason I tell that story is um, I had absolutely no intent as a medical student or as an intern or as an ONG trainee, because I did ONG first um, as part of a GP training program, to do either ONG or to do medical research. Not, uh, no intent whatsoever. And it's to make the point that there is no one road to a successful career. And you've heard from just the most amazing people today. And our city is one of the richest cities in biomedical research in the world. Never mind the country. It is the richest city in biomedical research in the country. But one of the richest in the world. There are few cities as special as Melbourne in terms of opportunities um, and outcomes from medical research. And as you look at these people, it's inevitable to think, as a young person, um, these people must have planned their career. Uh, the majority of us didn't plan anything. And we all got to where we got to through very different routes. Why do I tell you that? Because opportunities will come along. And as they come along, just say yes. Because some of those opportunities will never come along again. And you say yes, and then overnight you think, shit, how am I going to do that? It'll work out. So as, as people offer you um, opportunities to do projects or to do work or a new job that seems a bit out of left field, doesn't feel what you'd originally planned, just say yes. Now, we're all here because we're bright. We're all here because um, we're lucky enough to have been um, gifted um, some fairly high-functioning grey matter. But if we were honest, if we were honest, um, the attributes of the function of that grey matter that took us, um, that made us perform well, or allowed us to perform well at high school, that allowed us to succeed through medical school and into postgraduate training, the, the sole attribute of that grey matter, if we're honest, is that each and every one of us has a good memory. We can remember long lists of things, the top ten causes of anemia, the five most common causes of rectal bleeding, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Medicine, to be successful in medicine, as a doctor, you just need a good memory. Remembering the pages of the surgical textbooks, the medical textbooks, the ONG textbooks. Medical research is completely different. It's about thinking differently. And it's about being trained to think differently. Research is not just more medicine. I remember I did my uh, research training um, 18 months out of medical school. I was forced to do it. And, and, I mean, it would, the, my consultant boss in ONG who forced me to do research, today it would be called bullying. I mean, it would be, it would be up in front of Fair Work Australia or something, um, the things that he did to me to make me do research. It would be unallowable. Um, but I remember two years into a three and a half year research training program, full time formal research training, I remember driving to work in Edinburgh one morning thinking, just be, becoming aware that today I think differently to how I thought yesterday. That the way I approached my work, my research, was different to how I'd approached everything since I had been at high school, which had been really about learning stuff and remembering it. And I was good at learning stuff, and I was good at remembering it. And in professional exams, what we, what, what we called our exams at medical school, I was good at vomiting back those facts onto the page. Research had taught me to think, to be curious, to challenge what was accepted dogma, and to understand fundamental truths about human biology, and was much less interested in, sing, in simply remembering and regurgitating facts. Why is that important? Well, it's important because I learned a very difficult lesson when I went back to the wards to finish my clinical training. Because being someone who challenges everything on a ward round is really irritating 
to, to your seniors. And I went, when I went back as a senior house officer, a junior registrar in Australia, my registrar, my senior registrar, and my consultants were really irritated when I said, I don't believe that. Um, can, you give the, the, can you give this woman that drug? What for? I don't think, that, I don't think that's right. Um, so as you do research training, and as you have this dawning, this road to Damascus experience where actually you don't believe anything, and if, you, if we had been able to remotely dial into the myriad of ward rounds in our 15 metro hospitals this morning, half, half, if we're lucky, half of everything was said on those ward rounds was wholly without substance. And about a quarter of them were downright lies. Now the problem is, as a young clinician, a scientist coming back onto the ward, if you challenge that every day on every ward round, very soon people don't want to be around you. So you have to choose your battles and choose the things that you think are going to cause patient harm before you challenge. And you know, whether we like it or not, large chunks of our clinical workforce, doctors in particular, senior doctors in particular, don't like to be challenged. Now, research is this. It is super exciting. Now, look, not every day is like this. Some days are like this. <laughs> wow! And I remember those days, and they don't come along every so often, every day, but I remember the day, um, the, the very first day that I looked at an ELISA plate that told me we had invented a brand new test for Down syndrome back in 1992-93. And I was looking at the plate, I was the only person to have seen it. I was the only person in the world who knew we had invented a new blood test for Down syndrome screening. That test was subsequently used, it's moved on for, into non-invasive non prenatal testing now and it's obsolete, but it was used for the best part of 15 years. Tens of millions of women used that test um, to provide them quality information in their pregnancy. And for about a week, I was the only person in the world who knew we had that information. That was wow. Now, there are some days that it's much less wow. The days that your journal, uh, um, your manuscript is rejected by a journal. The day your grant application gets turned down. The day that you have to complete good clinical practice training in order for you to submit an ethics application. Actually, the day you have to submit an ethics application. Those are these days. Yeah? Um, but those days make the wow and the super exciting days all the more special. Now, the other thing about medical research um, is I'm, I'm going to take you, I'm going to um, use this example. It's now um, almost 200 years old. So, this is a description of a new development in healthcare. Um, unmarried women would unite in a sisterhood, wear the traditional bonnet of the married woman of the Northern Rhine region, go through professional training, and with this, address the social problems of the time. And they would do this either for a few years or even a lifetime. It sounds like something that Margaret Atwood would write about. But actually, it's the work of Theodore and his wife, Frederike uh, Fleidner. And they established Kaiserwerther, um, uh, the first deaconess hospital. So the first training hospital for deaconesses that still exist today, um, where women, unmarried women, would wear those Mar Mar Margaret Atwood-like um, he headgear, the, the headgear of the women, married women of the Rhine, um, and look after the ill and infirm in these Christian hospitals. Um, but they provided social care and religious support. They didn't actually provide health care. And one of the early pupils of Kaiserwerther, which is in what is now modern-day Dusseldorf in Germany, one of the early um, pupils of Kaiserwerther was this woman, Florence Nightingale. And Florence learned her craft at Kaiserwerther, but she left early because she recognized that the social care and the religious, the Christian support that was being offered and taught by Fleidner and his wife, Frederike, um, was not actually about health care. And of course, Florence Nightingale went on to establish what we now recognize as modern nursing, and she developed it through the Crimean War. But as she tried to write about and promote what we would call modern nursing, careful care of wound uh, dressing and wound management, etc., etc. 
As she tried to promote that in her writing, she was rejected and expelled from the deaconess um, uh, family. One of the things about health, about medical research, is you will come up with new ideas uh, and, and new um, concepts that will not be widely welcomed by the establishment. It's not easy selling new ideas, which takes me to the 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. Not a particularly great president. He managed some tax reform. He did manage some very minor social reform. But he said what I think are very wise words and words that have guided me through the obstacles that I have met. He said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men. We should have that unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. When I was a registrar, um, I looked after the high-risk pregnancy unit uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, we were seeing women with severe fetal growth restriction. And those of you who have done obstetrics and gynecology will recognize that one of the tests we use in that population is an ultrasound test of blood flow through the placenta, the umbilical artery Doppler. And in those very severely growth restricted, high risk pregnancies, absent end diastolic flows, so absent blood flow at the end of diastole and in the umbilical artery is a hallmark of the at risk fetus. And I noticed that in two women that we'd given corticosteroids to ahead of preterm birth to accelerate lung maturity, we saw a reversal in um, blood flow. So we saw blood flow return. Now, at the time, umbilical end, um, end, uh, absent end diastolic flow in umbilical artery was considered to be due to obliteration of placental blood vessels. That is, it was an irretrievable phenomenon. You could never reverse absent end diastolic flow. I said to my senior lecturer, consultant, Frank, I've just noticed two women who the blood flow has come back. He said, you idiot. You have no idea. Has anyone taught you how to do that test? That is a physical impossibility. So I planned a clinical trial and then actually took up a fellowship at Monash um, that year, 1996. And we never did the clinical trial. But when I arrived at Monash, they had this jotter, this journal in pencil, a record of 10 years worth of women with absent end diastolic flow. And it just so happened in pencil, we had the records of what happened to their blood flow before and after steroids. Leslie Baker was the senior midwife, and we published that paper in The Lancet. And this is the figure from The Lancet showing a return of end diastolic flow that then lasts about four or five days. Leslie presented this paper at the Perennial Society of Australia and New Zealand. She was ridiculed. Ridiculed so much I had to stand up and challenge the professors. I was a fellow challenge the professors, have you actually looked for this phenomenon? Uh, no, we haven't. Well, stop ridiculing someone who has studied this methodically. You will get ridiculed, you will get challenged. It is not easy. But the least easy thing are the skills that you will acquire. And of those skills, I think the most important, we've touched upon some of them today, is the ability to write. I don't know what we do to you at medical school, but you come out dreadful writers. Um, so choose, choose a, um, a supervisor who will teach you to write. Buy this book, Stephen Pinker's book, The Sense of Style. I get no royalties from Stephen. It is the best book on writing you will ever read. It is the only book on writing you will ever need. Buy it, read it, keep it on your desk, as you're writing the rubbish that you will write, because you will write rubbish, short sentences, strong verbs, and you will get your grants funded and you will get your papers published. Choose your supervisor. Choose your supervisor carefully. We heard that over the course of today and at lunchtime during the poster session. It's the supervisor that's most important. 
I'm going to leave you with the very wise words of three people. The governor, ex-governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's the dreamers, not the doubters, who shape the future. Have confidence in your dreams. These are the words of the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. I think the best first lady there's ever been. I think, and I know this is controversial, I think better than Michelle Obama. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of your dreams. Believe in your dreams. And even though you get knocked down, believe in your dreams. She goes on to say, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events and small minds discuss people. It is so easy to get sucked into talking about other people. Stand back from that and just, just talk about ideas. And I think one of the best quotes that the First Lady said was, and I say this importantly to the women in the audience, because you know, you know who you are and you know your abilities. But sometimes those abilities don't look like the people above you. Old men, sometimes aggressive men. Women are like tea bags, she said. You don't know how strong they are until you put them in hot water. And I leave you with my personal favorite person of all time, Amelia Earhart, the first woman to cross the Atlantic and the first woman to cross the Atlantic solo. And she said, she, she was, she was um, so direct. She said, the most effective way to do it is just do it. And the adventure is worthwhile in itself. Medical research, just do it. <laughs> it will make you a better doctor and it will blow your mind. Thank you very much.